living hell to me. You called it me since 1963. I've seen them come and go and I've seen them die. And long ago I stopped asking why. Although I've been in recovery for about 13 years, uh, in fact, over 13 years, I can still remember the feelings that I went to and what the similarities were between uh, my criminal thinking, my criminal actions, and my chemical dependency. Um, many years ago, I, uh, I remember going before the parole board uh, in one of our state institutions, and uh, they reminded me that my record indicated that uh, I stole just for the sake of stealing, that uh, some people steal because they need the money to get drugs, but I would steal even when I didn't need the money to, uh, to get drugs. And um, I had never thought about it before. But uh, when I went back and I started to review that thinking, especially after I got clean, is um, I think that what, what I was feeling is, I really think that uh, the euphoria of chemical dependency gave me power, that I didn't think anything was going to go wrong. Because uh, although I've heard a lot of people talk about they had certain character defects and certain behavior prior to their drinking, uh, I don't ever recall stealing prior to my using. But after I started using, after I became a full-blown addict, um, stealing was power to me. Thank you for returning to Bay Area Psychology. It seems to me that every time I turn on the television, the radio, or pick up a newspaper, I'm hearing about the latest horrendous crime. When I talk to people, I hear their discouragement and fear that we have a whole nother generation of children who've been left to roam the streets and prey on those around them. Blame seems passed around from the right, which sees our problem as a breakdown in family values with more prisons the only solution. To the left, which cites the increasing financial and social disparity between the haves and the have-nots in our country. Perhaps an overhaul of our benefit system to address childcare and social realities is called for. Well, regardless of our personal philosophies, right now money is pouring into the criminal justice system. As a result of three strikes, we will be incarcerating more people than ever. Who are these people, these criminals that we're using our taxes to take care of? What are they thinking? Tonight we have Richard Berenger, founder of Castle Recovery and certified instructor for the criminal thinker joining us. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. Okay, so when we talk about uh, these people, okay, and you hear people kind of talk about uh, criminals uh, as them and us, um, wh who are we talking about? What, can you give us a profile of the average person we're incarcerating right now? Well, in a while, we're going to be talking about the continuum of, of criminality, but oftentimes that question comes up. It is, who are these criminals? And as we look at the continuum of criminality, what we see is it's, it's a progressive thing. It's like chemical dependency. So oftentimes, your neighbor next door, your child, um, parole officers, parolees, people in, in positions of authority, often get caught up in some point in this continuum. So as we go through this process, I encourage everyone to take a look at themselves and where they're at on this continuum because we all fall into it at some point. Okay, so uh, through the course of the evening, we may occasionally begin to feel uncomfortable exactly. as we look at the different criteria and think, well, I think that. Exactly. Okay. I, I've heard people say, as I've done presentations, well, my next door neighbor's like that, or the, the guy at the auto shops are like that, or right. get, my kid displays these things. What's going on? Okay. So I, I encourage everyone to take a look at where, where they're at on this continuum. Okay. Now you are founder of Castle Recovery Services. Yes. How did you get interested in working with this particular population? Well, Castle Recovery Services itself started because there was a homeless parolee program that sort of went out of business. Okay. and. Uh, what happened is we came on board to provide services for them at this time. It uh, initially was just um, clean and sober living environments, but as I got interested in the whole criminal thought process, we took on a whole other element, which is the, the criminal thinker. Okay, and the criminal thinker is an actual um, uh, course, is it not? 
Well, it's, it's a course, um, it's a curriculum that's been developed by Kerner and Fawcett out of Beloit, Wisconsin, taken from the theories of Dr. Stanton Samanow and, and, okay. and Dr. Yokelton. Okay. Well, let's take a look. You mentioned the continuum of criminal thinking. Right. Let's take a look first at the responsible person, the person okay. that we're probably not going to see in our criminal justice system. Okay. Um, it looks like, first of all, maybe a pattern of accepting responsibility at home and work, society, a lifestyle based on hard work, fulfillment of obligations, derived self-respect and respect of others through achievement. This seems like maybe the way we'd like to think of ourselves. Maybe, you know, we have occasional thoughts about doing something that's against the law, but we make a choice not to do it. Exactly. Um, we are able to think about others. Uh, what kind of, can you say more about the kind of choices we might think of and then don't do? Well, in that one example there, it, it talked about oftentimes people think of doing certain things. They, they, they may think it would be nice to have this amount of money, and, and I know perhaps I might be able to get away with this, but their conscience, they have a conscience that stops them in their tracks, and rather than proceed with the criminal act, they look at the consequences, and it's a deterrent. What happens okay. for the criminals is they'll seek an opportunity and seize it and get involved and, and, and not really think about the consequences. So there's a different in thinking that, that's involved Okay, here. and also, my guess is the responsible person wouldn't just be the consequences that are imposed on them outside of themselves, but just like there's an internal consequence. Maybe we might feel less about ourselves. Exactly, or, okay. exactly. The self-esteem, who am I, you know, what is my responsibility, you know, as a citizen? Okay. And oftentimes a responsible thinker will look inside themselves and that deterrent within themselves will keep them from doing whatever the act might be. Okay, because they don't want to see themselves like that. Or they don't want to act like that, don't exactly. Like that. Okay. Exactly. Okay, so that sounds like the kind of person in general we're trying to raise our children to be uh, that uh, we are. And how successful do you think most people are in being that um, responsible? I think there's a lot of people that are very, very responsible. Unfortunately, in this day and age, when you talk about the crime bill, Okay. all the money being allocated for, for criminal activities. Oftentimes, I think the responsible person gets put out of the picture because we're so focused on what's happening in the United States these days, which is a lot of crime and a lot of fear and a lot of money. So looking at the media, the picture we might take away is that basically we're running amok. Exactly. Okay, when really, there's a lot of people who live their lives very well, very well, peacefully. That's very true. I think, if I'm correct, the figures are that 1% of the population commit about 70% of the crime, and unfortunately, oh, okay. our newspapers reflect that. What we often don't hear about is the person that, on a daily basis, is being responsible and doing what they're supposed to do and, and being accountable and making positive choices. Okay. Well, let's take a look at the next level. Okay. You know, maybe there's an in-between where occasionally we do think about um, uh, doing something illegal maybe going ahead and uh, making that you know, illegal driving decision or, or what have you. Okay. Um, and then we find out that it's not something maybe we want to continue to do as a pattern. So our second set of graphics talks to us about accepting some responsibility, but apparently we do use excuses. Maybe we'll lie, manipulate, mm -hmm. use intimidation, mm -hmm. make promises we don't keep. That's an interesting one, showing irresponsibility in some ways, but conscientious in others. What, uh, can you say more about that? Well, that's the fluctuation between being responsible and, and on the other one that we're talking about. It, it's not an arrestable thing. Lying to you or telling you I'm gonna be on time and not showing up or those sort of things are, are, are low key in the continuum and, and they're not arrestable, they're not arrestable offenses, however, the thing we need to look at in all this continuum is the patterns, the okay. over and over excuses on a daily basis. It would lead one to believe that perhaps this whole continuum is progressive and an individual is escalating from one point to the other. Okay, so if you know I'm working with somebody who occasionally doesn't do what they say they're gonna do, that's a different level than somebody who routinely fails to do what they say they're going to do. It's a different level, but um, at the same time, it needs to be confronted because if there's not an intervention, these patterns will continue to go on. They'll, they'll escalate and become more frequent. So with the population that I work with, whether they're five minutes late one time every couple of weeks or they're late every day, I treat each incident as if it was sometimes, to them anyway, it's the end of the world. What's the big okay. deal? 
Okay. Exactly. Because what you're doing is challenging and changing what for the criminal thinker is normal. Exactly. Making, okay. um, making a big deal out of it. Making okay. a big deal. You were late. What's going on? Not asking him why because they'll take me around the world, but what's going on here? Okay, so, and actually, if, so if we're working with somebody like this, they like the question why. It gives them an opportunity to they engage us in a story, engage us in... Exactly. They love the question why, and they okay. have got all kinds of answers. Okay. So it sounds like to develop in a progression, I wouldn't be doing this in isolation. I would have people around me who might support my irresponsible behavior, who maybe allow me to lie to them. Exactly. And don't say uh, what's up and uh, put some limits. That's why it's extremely important in particular agencies for everyone that's going to be involved with, with working with this particular population okay. to be knowledgeable of this whole continuum. You can't have one staff member working with a group of people that are going to allow things to go on that are not acceptable to another one. Okay. Everyone's got to be on the same page. Okay, that's important. Sure. I also noticed part of the criteria in the um, non-arrestable irresponsible was uh, they don't expect to succeed. In fact, expect to fail. Are we talking about a self-esteem issue there? Or? Well, it, it could be called a self-esteem issue. It, it's, it's like the person that gets out of perhaps county jail and is walking down the street and, and isn't going to go look for a job because inside them they know they're not going to get one. Okay. I've been arrested this one time, so I, I just know that no one's going to hire me. Oftentimes, it, it, it's a setup to fail, and really what it is, is it, it's an excuse to be irresponsible. Okay, so if I can be irresponsible telling myself that I really can't help it, that's a way that I can be comfortable with that behavior. That's a way that you can be comfortable with that behavior and confirm the fact that you are a victim, not a oh, victimizer. Okay. I'm a victim. Okay, so part well, of this, I try. how about that? So part of this thinking is feeling like the world owes me something. I've actually been victimized by the system. Absolutely, the okay. absolutely. It's one of the thinking errors, a real, real strong one. Okay, how do you challenge that kind of thinking? Well, <laughs> it, it's a process. Okay. You know, it, it's not an event. It, it evolves into a process. And, and what has to happen, again, the staff have to all be um, accountable and on the same page. But I challenge everything that the client says, okay. um, and, and it's a process. Okay, so in, in, when you're working with this population, uh, I'm not going to get away with telling you that uh, the world owes me because I had a bad childhood. Exactly. Okay, because I know traditionally, you know, uh, psychotherapy has not been successful working with the criminal population. That's true. Because what yeah. we do is we go back and we look at somebody's childhood and we do make a connection between uh, family of origin and kind of a difficult background and current behavior. That's and true. it sounds like this kind of person would be very comfortable in that kind of system and in fact maybe become able to work that system and, uh, incur and, and kind of draw from that. You're exactly right. To keep they, themselves going. They will, um, this population will in fact, when incarcerated, come up with all kinds of reasons like you're talking about. Okay. Born in a bad neighborhood, mom was on welfare, dad was in prison, um, born in the ghetto, drug addiction in my family, all of which, I want to add, certainly impact the client's life. Absolutely. However, however, there are choices to be made and what we found working with this population when a client begins displaying and talking about those right. incidences, I ask them, what about your other brothers and sisters? Did they all make the choices you made? It just, and we're going to talk more about those choices when okay. we come back. When we return from our break, we're going to meet